In today's episode, I'm speaking with Morley Robbins. He is a former hospital consultant turned self-taught expert on the role of trace minerals in health. He strongly advocates for identifying and correcting mineral deficiencies as a strategy to optimize health. In this episode, we go pretty deep into the biochemical mechanisms of how the body uses copper and iron, and particularly how they relate to mitochondrial health. We finish with a discussion about soil mineral depletion and the effects that monocropping, including the widespread use of the herbicide glyphosate, is hap- is uh, uh, impacting the chelation of copper uh, and therefore reducing its prevalence in the food supply. This interview is quite dense and quite technical, uh, but it was very interesting to get Morley's opinion on things. And we I cross-referenced his point of view with a lot of the guests that I've had on previously, including Dr. Jack Cruz and, and Laszlo Boros. So have a listen, tell me what you think, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Mr. Molly Robbins, thanks for coming on the Regenerative Health Podcast. Max, I'm thrilled to be here and look forward to our discussion. So give the listeners a background on yourself and how you arrived at exploring this amazingly interesting world of minerals and how they affect human health. I grew up in a very sickly family uh, here in the States. Um, mom was an alcoholic and dad was manic depressive, with schizophrenia. And uh, my sister became a nurse and I was supposed to become the doctor and uh, fate, fate got in the way. Uh, <laughs> I found out I wasn't a good student. But I went into hospital management and then consulting. I did that for 32 years and developed frozen shoulder from pulling a suitcase behind my back for 20 years through airports, hither and yon. And um, friends at a health food store told me to go see Dr. Liz. Well, I knew that was a chiropractor. And I said, I don't do witchcraft. Well, Dr. Liz is now my wife, and she's the one who introduced me to natural healing. Um, And she sparked this interest in me around uh, understanding the innate healer. I'd, I'd never heard that phrase in 32 years of working in hospitals. And I'd had thousands of conversations with doctors. I'd never heard that phrase, innate healer. I thought, if there's an innate healer, why do we have all these doctors? You know, why do we need doctors? And so uh, I took it upon myself to really delve into the world of metabolism. And in, as you probably know, wrote a book called Cure Your Fatigue, because what most people don't know is that every symptom in the Merck manual, and there's 32,000 of them that are profiled, every one of them begins with cellular energy deficiency. And, and that's a really important concept for people to realize is if, if the mitochondria start to wobble and can't do their work, they, they, they do more than just make ATP. They're, they're incredibly uh, active um, organelles, as you know. But um, if the mitochondria go, well, then there goes the, the I guess, the intelligence of the cell. And, uh, and that's, that's really been my area of focus. Interesting. And the, this concept of the innate healer is, uh, I, I understand what you're saying, is one that is very much sidelined or not profiled throughout medical mm-hmm. orthodoxy, throughout doctor's education, throughout treatment yeah. guidelines. It's sidelined for prescriptions, for surgeries, for various types of interventions. And I mean, that's another whole conversation in itself, but there's a reason why um, the structures exist and profit is made on not <laughs> promoting the innate healer yeah. within each and every one of us. But l- let's start with mitochondria because this is a topic that I've been very much leaning into over the past um, six months. And regular listeners to my podcast have heard from Dr. Jack Cruz and we've heard um, from Dr. Laszlo Boros and a range of other guests. And okay. I, I really think that putting the mitochondria at the center of our disease um, paradigm kind of gives us the most explainability for these so-called complex diseases like neurodegeneration, mm-hmm. cancer, autoimmunity, uh, and metabolic disease. And th- there's so much to be said about it, but really basically there, there, there's this bacteria that got 
simply enslaved, you know, hundreds of a billion years, billion and a half years ago, and and then subsequently make uh, you know energy for us in a symbiotic relationship. So, um, as you mentioned, they do a lot more than make ATP, and um, critically, they make water, metabolic water that um, is deuterium right. depleted, um, amongst a range of other f- facets, and they, they're obviously receiving light frequencies. So, so talk to us about how you think about mitochondria in the context of all your research and all your work. Yeah. Well, uh, it's important to put the word purple in front of bacteria. They're purple bacteria. There's a color to their existence. And and how do we get the color purple? Oh, it's a blending of red and blue. So when you get into the the mechanics of, of the mitochondria and you begin to explore the electron transport chain, so there's, there's four complexes there. And then when that's working with complex five, you have what's called oxidative phosphorylation, as you know. Well, complex four is the, uh, it's a critical step. And we live on a planet that has 20% poison in the air. It's called oxygen. And it's not our friend. It really isn't. It's a very it's a very toxic element. And the reason why we're here, the reason why you and I are having this conversation on these very fancy devices, talking to each other thousands of miles away from each other, is because higher intelligence requires higher levels of energy that were made possible by the harnessing of oxygen to burn fuel, right? We that, that's those are the fundamentals, but the part that people seem to gloss over is that there can be no life on planet Earth without copper. It's impossible. It is the only element on the planet that can regulate iron and oxygen at the exact same time and not create static. And everybody misses that. And you probably know about the great oxygen event 3.4 billion years ago, right? Who came to our rescue? Cyanobacteria, right? Cyanobacteria, blue bacteria. Cyano is a, it's very important to know the colors. So cyanobacteria started playing with the sunlight and releasing oxygen because they were engaging in photosynthesis. So it's exciting that you've talked to Jack Cruz, but it's important to recognize that there's three steps to photosynthesis. There's photosystem one, there's photosystem two, but there's a step in between. Did you know that? Plastocyanin. Plastocyanin is the critical step. And it turns out that photosystem one occurs second. It was discovered first. That's why it has the Roman numeral one. But photosystem two is the first step, moves the electrons to plastocyanin, and plastocyanin moves the electrons to photosystem one. Plastocyanin does not work without copper. Therefore, photosynthesis does not work without copper. Therefore, you can't release oxygen into the air without copper. But the the catch is you can't turn that oxygen into two molecules of water without proper copper uh, concentration in complex four. And so it turns out that complex four is a two-stroke engine. There's a downstroke that creates hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and there's an upstroke that turns that H2O2 into two molecules of water. So what are the mitochondria? They're water wheels. They're water wheels. And and I see the whole deuterium issue a little differently, is I think that it's a sign of defective copper concentration. One of the the great copper researchers, Paul Cobine, he's at Auburn University. He's originally from Canada, Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, did his doctoral work there, and then became a professor at Auburn University. Guy is brilliant. 
But in 2004 and in 2006, he's the guy that figured out, based on a yeast model, yeast are many mammals. It's a very cool concept. Their, their metabolic structure and activity is identical to mammals. It's just a lot smaller. And um, based on his model, he discovered that there's 50,000 atoms of copper in the matrix of the mitochondria. And the complex four that we're talking about, where oxygen becomes two molecules of water, um, that complex is blue, sky blue. And what's really important for that complex to work right? Red light. Oh, there we go, blue. And so what, is, what does blue tissue do? It attracts red light. And the mitochondria love that red light. People, people swear by their red lights and their red lasers, not knowing that all, all they're real, revealing is that they're copper deficient. Because what, what does, what's the, the frequency of red light? Oh, it aligns perfectly with the frequency of copper. What's the frequency of blue light? Oh, it aligns perfectly with the, with the frequency of iron. So you hear these, hear these two metals opposing each other, expressing different forms of light. And it's absolutely amazing that I think a kindergartner could understand this better than a physician because they understand colors. And they, and they, think, they think differently. And, and, and I think the, the phrase that I use, and I, and I didn't say that to uh, punch you in the nose, Max. It's just most physicians don't know how energy is made. Most physicians don't know how blood is made. And this is the fundamentals of our metabolism. And it's important that the way I approach it is let's ignore the enemies, you know, the, the pathogens and the toxins and the heavy metals. Let's ignite the energy. That's what this is all about. And I think that aligns with your desire is to help your clients increase their metabolic profile so that their machinery and their, their messaging, their signaling can be at an optimal level. Yeah, for sure. And I'll give you, the listeners, a, a bit of a background about that um, great oxygenation event. And the the, the point that you, you brought up, Morley, was that it, the, the world was an incredibly unhospitable place back um, yeah. those, those three billion years ago. It wasn't conducive to life as we know it um, existing. And that those... Uh, uh, cyanobacteria essentially existed in the oceans. They used, they harnessed solar energy to um, produce oxygen as a as a byproduct of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And th they bubbled along for so many billion years that they eventually changed the content of the atmosphere. So the dynamics, the new, right. the uh, the nutrient dynamics changed so that um, uh, that we're able to evolve. The, these uh, oxygen uh, aerobic um, metabolism was able to to evolve. So that's a that's a, f a very interesting point. And what you've talked about in terms of the specific role of copper um, in the electron transport chain in, in the mitochondria is also fascinating, because um, as you as you've given us an overview we can't do these fundamental processes, which is photosynthesis and oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation is a reversal of photosynthesis. I think I'll, I'll hammer that point home yeah, right. because, because yeah. photosynthesis is taking light um, and uh, it's, it's taking water and it's turning that into, um, it's turning that into basically sugar, essentially carbo carbohydrate right. chains. And, and what we do when we, burn substrates in our mitochondria is we're taking those chains of of hydrocarbons uh, and, and we're taking oxygen and the outcomes is is water uh, and and co2 so right. and, and i also i also want to emphasize the point that you made which is that that fourth complex is a red light receiver and the value or the role of red light therapy one of them is that it it's assisting in the function of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And I think there's right. even newer evidence that, that the structured water in the mitochondria is also um, acting as a chromophore, is acting as a, a, a absorber of, of water. So the, the question then I think that's relevant is we're trying to optimize these mitochondrial function and we're doing right. so through a light environment. We do so through food substrates into the electron transport chain. And Dr. Laszlo Boris, who I agree with, um, advocates strongly for fully grass-fed um, butter and, and beef 
um, tallow, oh. the long chain uh, fatty acids, um, as, as well as ketones. But what you're proposing is that we can also tune these mitochondrial engines by ensuring adequate amount of these trace minerals. So, so talk to us about mm -hmm. um, about that that idea. Yeah. So let's let's go back to that that uh, GOE, great oxygenation mm -hmm. event. Three three chemicals came and, and saved us. They're really important to understand. So, uh, to get a little technical, uh, there's something called multi copper oxidases. These are enzymes that turn oxygen into water in one fell swoop. It's it's actually a four step process, but but they're called MCOs. We have a thousand different forms of MCOs in our gut. Think about that. But but they. But it happens like that. So the oxygen becomes two molecules of water at the courtesy of this enzyme. So that was the first really important um, development. Second, um, you've probably heard of melatonin, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's, it, more yeah. Than, it's more than a sleep aid. It's yeah, the master it, antioxidant. It's, yeah, and, go ahead. And, yeah. and it evolved, Dandy. That's the point that Dr. Russell Ryder has yeah. made, is that it evolved mitochondrial uh, antioxidant capability well before it was a, a circadian signal was, and well before it was a, a, a huh. sleep inducer. Yeah, and it's, it, it's the master antioxidant inside the cell. So melatonin is the master antioxidant in the cell, in the, inside the mitochondria, excuse me. Glutathione is the master antioxidant in the cell and ceruloplasmin is the master antioxidant protein in our body. <laughs> and the, so there's a, there's a real critical requirement to manage this oxygen. And so that was the second chemical, was melatonin. And the third is my favorite, that um, you've heard of cholesterol, right? <laughs> It was the third chemical that that, that came on the scene. And, and it, it's important to understand that uh, in order to make cholesterol, it requires 11 molecules of oxygen. So the production of cholesterol is in response to copper deficiency. So when you, when you don't have enough copper to metabolize the oxygen, the body has this wisdom to say, well, I'm going to store it in, in cholesterol and we'll, we'll begin to make things from this. And so that th those three chemicals are some of the most important. And so what's happened in the, in the modern world is we, <clears throat> we don't know anything about the GOE. We, we think that melatonin is a sleep aid, and we don't know that it's being made in every mitochondria of our body. And we have 40 quadrillion mitochondria, and it's distributed unevenly throughout the body. The number of mitochondria in the heart is very different than the liver, is very different than the neurons of the brain. The neuro, some of the neurons have 2 million mitochondria. That's important to know. That's, that's, I mean, especially like the substantia nigra, where you get Parkinson's. It's, it's an enormously um, dependent upon functioning neurons in the, uh, the neurons of the, of the substantia nigra. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because this idea of human diseases, these um, complex diseases, diseases that are killing people, so neurodegeneration, heart disease, they are diseases of organs with the most mitochondrial density. Uh, and and yes. let me add in yes. um, age-related macular degeneration because that, uh, the retina has the highest density of, of mitochondria. So if we, and, and the endocrine system is also um, quite dense. So if we're thinking about what's killing people and, and what you know I see in, in my GP clinic, what um, we see in, in terms of the general medicine um, uh, you know, inpatient ward. Uh, these are all diseases of organs of the highest mitochondrial density. And when you, I mean, bringing up the, the substantia nigra, that's an excellent point. Um, and um, that, that's a whole kind of another topic we can talk about melanin um, and neuromelanin. But the role of melatonin, uh, I, I think of as this kind of guardian of, of the mitochondrial uh, right. genome. It's the it's a mitochondrial DNA guardian because it's being made on site and um, to to quench this oxidative stress that's occurring as a natural byproduct of mm -hmm. um, of oxidative metabolism. And it, it, maybe maybe we talk about this. Maybe it's a bit of a detour, but the the idea of quenching oxidative stress is not necessarily um, a good idea when these 
kind of biophotons are also being used in a very, very finely tuned signaling mechanism. So it's not always the best idea to 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 get get rid of them all. But um, I, I really love it how uh, Dr. Robert Fosbury um, presented this idea of of melatonin in in mitochondria, and he described a cooling and a lubrication system. The the, mm -hmm. the cooling yeah. is the the melatonin because it's being made on site, and the lubrication was was the red light because it in, in in terms of helping um, the, those uh, mitochondrial complexes operate. So l l let's continue the discussion about um, about mitochondria. I think um, you're onto a good thing. So that again, the, and the goal is, and I and I think I, I don't know that I've ever talked with anyone who understood the link between quote disease and density of mitochondria. So I, my hats off to you for that. That's a very nice way to describe it, because um, that's that's in fact true. And um, what happens to the mitochondria is they they are great recyclers of substrates. Uh, they're, they're recycling calcium. They're recycling amino acids. But one of the most important things they need to recycle is called iron. If the, <clears throat> Here's something that you may or may not know. <laughs> and I find this fascinating. Scientists and clinicians do not know how oxygen gets into the mitochondria. If I were to ask you, you'd say, what's diffusion? No, we're talking about the master prooxidant. It's the second most reactive element on the planet. After fluorine gas, oxygen's number two. So we're not going to have passive diffusion of, of a gas into the mitochondria. So it's an act of transport. And the people who came the closest were Wittenberg, Wittenberg, husband and wife team back in 2007. And they threw up their hands and said, we don't know how it happens. No one knows how oxygen gets into the mitochondria. The, the, the most provocative theory about it uh, is Dr. Solis Herrera, son man, down, down in Mexico. Have you had a chance to talk with him? I haven't, but I've, I'm, I'm cursorily I'm sure uh, yeah. aware of his work. Yeah, go go yeah. on. Brilliant, because he's... Brilliant, brilliant guy. And his whole theory is that the melanin is, around, is on the outside of the mitochondria, and so it's engaging in photosynthesis and releasing the, the oxygen. Still, I'm not sure that he knows how it's getting in there, but there's this back and forth between melanin and the, and the um, mitochondrial activity. It's a brilliant model. It makes, it makes so much sense conceptually. I, I think he's still challenged to be able to prove it, but he has a wonderful book on human photosynthesis, which is just phenomenal to read. Um, but I think people need to understand that there's some real gaps in our understanding, there's just this, well, the oxygen gets into the mitochondria. It's like, well, wait, let's start right there. How did that happen? And it's happening at a very fast rate, right? And so the the other thing that people, a lot of people don't know is that everyone puts the, the electron microscope on complex four, oh, it's copper dependent. What well, turns out the complex one, three, four, and five are all copper dependent. It, it, it and Complex two is just an enigma. We, you know, I, I don't. We won't go there right now. But the thing is, if one, three, four, and five are copper dependent, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that the gears of the mitochondria start to grind to a halt, and what? And if and if the mitochondria can't make heme, that's really where where critical breakdown is, as you as you likely know. And the thing is, there's eight enzymes. To make heme, four of them are occurring inside the mitochondria in the matrix. Hmm, there's a lot of copper in that matrix, right? So four occurring inside the mitochondrial matrix, and four occurring outside the mitochondria. So the ones that that end in the word oxidase, it's a pretty good bet that the copper is involved because copper has a unique ability to work with oxygen to oxygenate and and to harness that energy, and that is lost in the world of conventional medicine. Again, I don't think practitioners understand how energy is made, and they don't understand the mechanics of what the mitochondria are doing, nor do they understand the signaling. Do, do you know much about uh, the PAM enzyme, P-A-M enzyme? Have you ever heard of that? So there's yeah. an enzyme. 
Um, it's called peptidoglycine alpha amidating monooxygenase. It's 35 letters long. And Max, I get a dollar every time I say it. <laughs> but it it's <clears throat> there are 4,700 signaling peptides inside our body. And what may surprise you is that those peptides are made in the form of parked cars. Does your car in the driveway allow you to get to the store? No, you've got to turn it on, right? You've got to start the engine, right? And the signaling peptides need to be turned on. And, and there's a glycine at the end that needs to be cleaved off. And then an amine group is attached. And then suddenly the hormone can signal. Hormones like insulin, insulin growth factor, um, you know, just hemopexin, spexin. These are things that people have never heard of. And they're all involved in sugar metabolism and the signaling that's taking place inside the tissue, inside the cell, inside the mitochondria. And if it's literally, this, when this is on, it works, right? You, you called me yesterday and my, my phone lit up and I decided to ignore the fact that I didn't know who the phone number was, thank God. But, but the point is, I got a call, the phone worked, and that's great. And we were able to, to, to come to consensus. But if the tissue can't communicate with itself, if, if, the, if the insulin can't tell all of the other many peptides that it's on the scene, that's what we're up against. And here's the most important part. The PAM enzyme is copper dependent. It doesn't work without copper. Why? Because it's working with oxygen, monooxygenase. And so I've talked to probably 100 doctors. I've yet to meet a doctor who even knows what I'm talking about. And to me, it's we're, we're at the basis of how the uh, metabolism communicates with itself. Think, think about, hey, hey, we got some incoming, we got something to do, we got it. And if they, if they can't get the signal through, if it's just static, or if it's an incomplete signal, it's like it's one bar as opposed to five bars. And, and people aren't aware of that. And so the cornerstone of the, of the uh, root cause protocol is missing information equals missing truth. If you don't know that the mitochondria do more than just make ATP, if you don't know that, as you pointed out, that disease is highly expressed in mitochondrially dense tissue, if you don't know that, this, that these organelles need to communicate with each other, to me, the mitochondria are the brains of the outfit. The, the nucleus is just a Xerox machine. Just, and, and what I really want to know, and I'm hoping that you can give me some insight on this, who's running the mitochondria? There's got to be, a, there's got to be an orchestra leader, right? There's got to be someone saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this, we're going to do that. Who's doing that? I've yet to find the, the is, it, is it the hypothalamus? Is it some nucleus within the hypothalamus? Or I, I'm just, that's one of my greatest quests is to find out where's the nerve center that's running the mitochondria within the cell, within the tissue, within the organ, within the organism. I just, that, that's the part that absolutely fascinates me. You're raising so many fascinating points, Molly, and I will just say what initially just came to my mind in, in the answer of your most recent question. And it speaks to this idea of centralization versus decentralization. And right. if right. we've thought about the, the model of medical care and science up till now, it's been DNA, RNA focused. It's about finding monogenic causes of disease. It's about targeting right. single gene pathways to, to solve problems um, medically. But um, what, I, I think we're both in agreement about is that the, this is the story is in the mitochondria, and this is a decent story of decentralization, and it's a story of a de, of this decentralized 
uh, system where right. um, we're essentially more worried about our mitochondrial DNA than our, than our nuclear DNA. And right. if we're taking this centralization and decentralization um, lens, then I think the answer to your question is that there's not one place in the body. It's th th these bacteria, these ancient bacteria, they're environmental sensors. And when we manipulate the mitochondria to increase their efficiency with light, um, with, with red light, with UV light, um, with different white light wavelengths, when we manipulate their function with cold, which essentially re reduces the space between those respiratory proteins and increases the efficiency of electron tunneling, when we um, increase their efficiency with, uh, with ketone bodies or, or long chain fats. And th this is a story of environmental sensing. I I I'm inclined to think that it's and grounding. We haven't even mentioned grounding the free electron, free electrons that you can get. And um, so, so I would say that they're coordinated in a in a decentralized way by sensing the envi environment that they're in. Yeah, and, and and to me, the 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 piece that that I've elected to focus on, just because it it makes the most sense intuitively, and and it's worn out in the research, is the the bioavailability of copper is what ties it all together. The, the, I, one of my most amazing conversations uh, via one of my students down in Australia, she's a, a naturopath, well, one of her mentors is a, uh, he's a chiropractor of 40 years, a naturopath of 40 years, but he's been an alchemist studying copper and iron for 30 years. It was, it was a fascinating conversation. His name is John. And he said, you know, Morley, it would be important for you to know that, that copper has a magnetic attraction for light. I went, well, that makes so much sense when you think about photosynthesis. He said, but it also has a magnetic attraction for ammonia. So what does that represent? Sunlight and ammonia, well, that's the beginning and end of life. And copper has a relationship. People don't realize that there's four enzymes to break down ammonia. The first is a copper-dependent enzyme. And if that obligate enzyme doesn't work right, well, you're going to have a buildup of, of ammonia and you're going to have brain fog. And, it, and where is this happening? In the liver. And there's probably a, a component of it that's uh, happening in the spleen as well. But the point is, people are not aware of the thousands of activities, enzymatic activities, that are being uh, regulated by the um, activity of oxygen and iron by copper hiding behind a curtain. And how do we spell curtain? C-U hyphen R-T-A-I-N. So we can see the symbol for copper. And that's, you made the point earlier, there's no money in a cure. How do we spell cure? Oh yeah, C-U hyphen R-E. And so the, the, the basis of the conventional model is on illness, is on lack of energy and the world doesn't know that. You know, I think it's a very small percentage of practitioners who really understand the way you do, that there's this energy dynamic that's really behind the, quote, disease dynamic. And, and that's, that's the, the amazing work of Douglas Wallace at uh, UPenn, uh, amazing uh, writer and thinker. And, and if it were up to me, I'd give him a Nobel Prize or two uh, for his work so far. But it's just, it's amazing that, that more people don't know about the central role of energy regulation to drive the whole signaling and all of the other dynamics that we're talking about. Yeah, you, you took the words out of my mouth. I was just about to reference Dr. Doug Wallace um, for the yeah. listeners and his seminal yeah. work on mitochondria and um, the, the bioenergetic, the mitochondrial bioenergetic etiology right. of disease, which is basically giving explanatory power to all these diseases that we're dealing with in the clinic that um, the, the medical paradigm that, that isn't able to um, provide any kind of useful um, treatment. And the, the, I think that gets to the crux of what you're saying, Morley, which is if you understand the fundam fundamentals of what's going on, then you can reason and by deduction to work mm -hmm. out what, what the right. most effective treatment is. But if you don't understand how the system works, um, if you don't understand how an engine works, then you know you're going to be pouring vinegar into the fuel tank instead of um, you know instead of <laughs> instead of fuel. So that that that's a bit of an analogy for where we are. And before we go into start talking about the clinical implications, and um, we need to talk. I think we need to talk about these quantum biology concepts, and we need to talk about um, 
this idea that um, the proteins and um, complexes inside the body, they're acting as um, semiconductors. And no one has talked about this more than, than, than Jack Cruz. And his, um, I mean, is it, incredibly complex and, and deep. But this idea that these physical quantum pr properties are occurring within the body. So, so talk, talk to us about how you integrate those ideas into this copper and kind of um, mineral centric view. Again, it's, it's about the efficiency of uh, interaction. And uh, you, you talked about uh, red light being the, the oil. I, I, I've never heard it described that way, but it makes so much sense. Um, it, it's being able to efficiently harness the light and the energy that, that is intended to be a part of our um, cellular structure. And so um, I think the, the challenge is a lot of people aren't grounded in mitochondrial enzyme activity. They don't know about the handoffs of electrons and what what the enzyme activity is that enables that movement of the electrons. Uh, and that and more often than not, those handoffs are made courtesy of copper, the, the bioavailability of copper. Um, you know, that in ni 1985, um, uh, Earl Frieden, who was then the, the preeminent iron biologist on the planet, he theorized that, that ceruloplasmin, which is the, the master protein, copper protein, was the supply line for the mitochondria. You know, that, that there's, there's this constant sourcing of copper to the mitochondria throughout the body. Well, he was resoundingly criticized for that. And in 2017, Zach Baker proved that he was right. That, that, that without of steady supply line, the mitochondria don't don't work right, and the and the um, electrodynamics of the mitochondria don't work right. You know, there was a time um, we've heard of the telegraph wires and 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 the communication that took place with telegraph. The original wires for the telegraph were were iron. Back in the eighteen fifties, they were iron. And then someone figured out that copper was three times faster to transmit electrons. And so then suddenly everyone adopted um, the, the copper side. And the way I look at it is um, what, what makes a tall building stand still? What's, it's steel girders, right? And what are they made out of? Iron, right? But what is it that makes a tall building move? Well, it's, it's copper because it runs the plumbing and it runs the electricity. And I think it works the exact same way in our body and inside our mitochondria. The, the way I describe it, Max, is that in, in the world of conventional science and conventional medicine, is um, they love to liken the mitochondria to a kitchen. And every kitchen has a stove, right? And we put a big spotlight on the stove What's the stove made out of? Well, it's made out of iron, right? And, but does the stove, does the stove know what is going to be cooked that day? Does the stove know what temperature the burner should be? Does the stove know what the temperature should be in the, in the oven? No, no. Turns out there's actually a chef. I call it a cuisine artist. Who again, Got to spell it right, right? And so no one talks about the cuisine artist inside the kitchen managing and regulating the stove. And it turns out that when you get inside the mitochondria, when you get inside complex four, there's heme A and heme A3, right? How do, you, how do you make heme A and heme A3? Well, you got to have copper. That's in the literature. It's copper dependent. And so what is heme and heme three? It's actually the stove that holds the oxygen so the copper can slice and dice it and move the electrons and hydrogen atoms in to enable it to become water. But everyone is fixated on the stove and no one can see the chef. And then the other, the other member of the restaurant 
that's so important is the waiter, right? Right? 70% of the iron in our body is a waiter carrying oxygen, carrying carbon dioxide, right? If we include myoglobin, it's 80% of the iron in the body is a waiter. Well, do we go to a restaurant for the waiter or are we going there for the, an experience with the food? I would contend that it's we go there for the chef, not the waiter. And so I think all of the optics and thinking about how energy is made, how energy is regulated, how energy is expended is more copper centric than anything because of the very nature of how the process takes place. And I don't think there's enough um, sensitivity to that in a lot of the discussion is that the, the physics of the, of the mitochondria is copper dependent because we're moving electrons, because we're moving photons, and it's, and it's a very copper dependent process. The analogy to the biz, the building and the electricity transmission really um, gives me more context and really helps me understand that makes intuitive sense. Um, anyone who's touched a copper pipe um, or a copper spoon, it conducts heat, it conducts electricity that much quicker right. than, than those other metals. So from a biological point of view, it makes sense to me that if we're trying to handle electrons in the most efficient way, and, and, and that's a great point to make, to hammer home this idea that mother nature is the most is the most experienced and the uh most expertise expert engineer and she has mm -hmm. crafted Absolutely. these organisms over periods of billions of years through um the most robust system which is trial and error and and the simple failure of organisms that didn't have the most um thermodynamically efficient um, makeup mm -hmm. so um it, it's a it's a fascinating way to think about it um uh, morley so yeah that's that's really great Maybe we can now talk about the the kind of clinical implications, or or or, or try or, or zoom out from mitochondrial level to kind of whole body and um, physiology, and and discuss how copper is regulated. Because the corollary of what you've just talked about to me, um, I'm thinking that we need to avoid a frank total body copper deficiency if we want those mitochondrial the mitochondrial function to to be optimized. Well. The Great, great point, and, and look forward to the discussion now. Um, we have to get past the meme that runs the planet. The meme, the meme, the central meme on planet Earth is you're anemic and you're copper toxic. And you'd be amazed where that is woven into the thought process of the individual and their practitioner. And the fact of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, it's just the opposite. One of the most central um, paradigms of, of understanding metabolism is to know that an animal, you and I are animals, whether we like it to think of that, uh, that way, but when an animal is denied copper in its diet, iron builds in its liver. That's That's been well established. It goes back to 1928, the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Hart, Steenbach, Waddell, and LVM uh, in March of 1928 proved that. Then in May of 1928, Dr. McHarg, James McHarg at University of Kentucky, was able to prove that denying copper to an animal caused iron to build in the red blood cell. But that's not necessarily good. And so there's this, there's this really critical uh, seesaw. If you deny copper, iron builds. And We've now we've been talking for almost it's been about fifty minutes, so every second of every day, so fifty minutes times sixty times two and a half million red blood cells need to be replaced every second. In the course of twenty four hours, we need to replace over two hundred billion red blood cells. That's a lot of red blood cells. But what that's predicated on is the ability to move iron out of the tissue because it needs to be recycled. Because it turns out that, believe it or not, it's, a, it's about 215 billion red, red blood cells. To, to replace that many red blood cells, you need 25 milligrams of iron. 
Average average man has about 5,000 milligrams of iron. Average woman, about 4,000. And that's a lot of iron, especially in a body that's run with just 100 milligrams of copper. So there's a 50 to 1 ratio of copper to iron, or iron to copper, excuse me. And so here's the most important part, though. We need 25 milligrams every 24 hours to replace 215 billion red blood cells. And 24 of those 25 milligrams of iron come from a recycling system called the reticuloendothelial system. I don't think it's taught in practitioner school anymore. I think what doctors are taught is that we need to eat 25 milligrams of iron daily. When in fact, we have this very sophisticated system of recycling the iron and, and it's got to get out of the recycling macrophages, principally in the spleen. Uh, and that if, if the iron gets stored in the liver, it's got to get out of the hepatocytes, but it's got to be released back into the recycling system to get to the bone marrow to support the production of two and a half million red blood cells a second. So we're taking two and a half offline we're replacing with two and a half every second. That's really important to understand that. And so 95% of the iron is copper dependent because the recycling macrophages have an iron doorway. It's called ferroportin, iron doorway. And the iron doorway is run by a copper doorman that's the work of uh, um, Giovanni Musi in, in Italy, uh, 2014. Amazing article about the, the copper-driven ferroportin uh, pathway. And what practitioners are being trained is that hepcidin regulates ferroportin. Well, hepcidin is a negative regulator. Ferrooxidase is a positive regulator. What's the difference between positive and negative? Positive would be like your mom making sure you get up on time to go to school. Negative regulator would be like a SWAT team coming and grabbing you out of your bed and throwing you into the school. Big difference between those two, right? And so the, bo the body runs on positive regulation unless there's a crisis. When does hepcidin come on the scene? When there's copper deficiency. That's the work of, of uh, Dr. Welch at the University of Utah in 2007. So again, doctors aren't taught that. And so the, the very basis of responding to your, your question, you got to ground your understanding about where does copper and iron intersect in the body in order to support the metabolism of the body. And so that recycling of iron that we were talking about earlier, that recycle or the remaking of heme, that's, that's copper dependent too, because you can't put iron into the heme molecule, there's an enzyme called ferrochelatase. Well, guess who's running the, guess who the crane operator is? It's copper. Brings the iron and drops it in the center of, it's just, do, doctors don't know that. So if you don't know the cornerstone of how it's done, then downstream, there's going to be a lot of confusion about uh, the, the mechanics of it. And so people need to, except the fact that the meme, you're anemic and you're copper toxic, is a lie, when in fact we exist on a planet now where the amount of glyphosate is killing the soil, as you probably know, and, and glyphosate is a perfect copper chelator. It will chelate copper a billion times faster than it will chelate magnesium. It will chelate copper a thousand times faster than it will chelate iron. And so we can't relate to those numbers. So there was a time, Max, when I could run an eight minute mile. And I was very proud of that. I was never a great athlete. But at the time when I could run an eight minute mile, my younger son clocked a 402 mile when he was in college. And I called him up and said, are you going to go for it? He said, no. He said, he said, I could work for months and maybe not, not shave those two seconds off. But his old man was curious. So I went to a gym to see what it was like to run a four-minute mile. 
and I got on the, the treadmill and cranked it down and was holding on for dear life and then realized, wait a minute, the machine's doing all the work. I'm just holding on and almost killed myself trying to get off of it. But the thing is, we can't relate to a thousand times faster, a billion times faster, because we barely know people who are twice as fast as we are. And so we get lost in the, the biodynamics of the minerals and these chemicals that we're now exposed to and the, the brainwashing that, oh, we need more iron and, oh, be careful of that copper. It's going to cause you a problem. We need to flip that narrative. And that's why I appreciate the chance to have this conversation so that more people can understand that, wow, there's, there's more to the story. And, and and just by way of uh, a parenthetically comment, I re I renamed what the uh, condition was back in 2020, around April or May of, of that year. The COV stands for Coppers Vanished, and ID stands for Irons Dysregulated. And we're back to Hart and McCarg, realizing that copper is missing, iron's building, and that's what the research is now showing what that whole event was all about. And people don't know that. And, and what does that do to our mitochondria? It kills the mitochondria. They can't, they can't process, they can't engage in their uh, constant activity of recycling and regenerating ATP. And it's just, it, it's, it's amazing how these fundamental cornerstone facts are not being taught to understand how the higher level functioning of the tissue is dependent upon that that process. Yeah, look, lots to explore there, Molly. Uh, I'll make a quick point on the glyphosate before we launch into iron dysregulation. But th this idea of glyphosate, when it was brought out, was you know it's a benign compound. It doesn't um, harm you know it doesn't harm human health. Uh, it's all well and good, and it's subsequently been sprayed on, you know, how many, maybe millions of billions of hectares right. of land. And I, I want to put my quick mention of the episodes where I've talked about glyphosate so and the mechanisms of toxicity. So it disrupts the shikimate pathway, which is a, a enzym, enzymatic mm -hmm. pathway that we need to make tyrosine, a bunch of other um, tryptophan, a bunch of other mm -hmm. Um, critical um, amino acids by nuking our gut microbiome. It's an endocrine, and I talked to, to Stephanie Seneff about that. It wrecks our mm -hmm. deuterium excretion process, so we so we're less able to deuterium deplete our bodies. It mm -hmm. acts as an endocrine disruptor after it's chelated, um, probably copper or uh, some other mag uh, minerals. And I talked to Dr. Anthony J about that. Um, it's it disrupts the the exclusion zone water that gets formed um, on 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 hydrophilic surfaces. So there's, there's so many ways that glyphosate is is harming human health, and none of them are being emitted or uh, by by the agricultural companies that make the stuff. None of them are being emitted by government regulators who continue to endorse um, and push this idea that it's a you know safe and tolerated chemical uh, and none of them are, none of these effects are, are aware of um are, are being, are being are known by clinicians so uh, i'm glad you brought up the glyphosate and maybe we can talk about that more um towards the end of the discussion when we uh, talk about the uh agricultural Im implications but but let me let, let, let's dive into iron dysregulation because you you mentioned um you mentioned the effect of iron in in COVID when when I when the pandemic first hit I was in uh, working in COVID wards and emergency department and we were measuring a serum ferritin and it was a hallmark of uh, the degree of inflammation and it was used as a prognosticator for who we're likely going to need to be sending to ICU and who we're going to need to be putting on um you know re respiratory support so. Right. In that situation, the, the ferritin was, um, as, as I understand it, was being used as a kind of acute phase reactant, meaning it was a, it was a marker of inflam inflammation in the body. It, going back to how I, I, I see it in, in my clinical practice, I always interpret it in the context of a C-reactive protein, which is, again, an inflammatory mediator. Because if, it, if it's, ferritin is high and CRP is high, it's not giving us a good indicator of iron status. It's simply just reflecting the background inflammation in the body. Um, so, so talk, talk to us about this use of ferritin um, as a kind of marker of iron store, as a marker of inflammation, and how you conceive of these concepts. Great. So first, first we have to understand that there's three different forms of ferritin in the body. There's 
ferritin heavy chain, there's ferritin light chain, and then there's secreted ferritin. And the form that the doctors are focused on is the secreted form. But what they're not taught is that the, the, the heavy chain, why is it called heavy? Because there's a heavy metal that's running it. What's that heavy metal? It's called copper. So we're back to the ferrooxidase enzyme function running the, uh, the process of bringing iron into the core. And what's, what's the light chain good at? It, it's good at storing, but it's not good at releasing. Got to have the heavy chain to let it out again. And what happens in the, the liver is where it's principally, when, it, when you see high levels of ferritin, you basically have a breakdown of, of the liver is taking place. And the recycling of, of the iron, the ferritin, is taking place within the lysosome of the uh, hepatocytes, really important process. And the lysosome is the stomach of the cell. And it's an energy-rich environment dependent upon what? Oh, yeah, copper is what's making the acidity rise in the lysosome. And so... If it can't complete that cycle properly, the iron gets dumped into the tissue, into the liver tissue, and what gets secreted from the hepatocyte is an abridged form of light chain. It's missing about 10 amino acids, and it gets picked up in the blood test as ferritin, but they don't distinguish between the ferritin missing 10 amino acids in the ferritin light chain. They just say ferritin's rising. Well, as soon as you have rising ferritin, you have iron dysregulation, principally in the liver. And so when, when you have this inflammatory response, the liver is not able to recycle the iron properly. The, the flip side of it is low ferritin. Everyone knows it. Well, low ferritin means you need more iron. No, it means that the spleen is on the ropes. And it's a completely different understanding of, of what the role of the red pulp macrophages is and their ability to store iron. And the missing, the missing piece of the puzzle in low ferritin is hemosiderin. When was the last time you did a hemosiderin test of any of your patients? Never. Because you were never taught to do that, right? So you're taught to do ferritin, but never hemosiderin. Why is hemosiderin important? Because it can hold 10 times more iron. It's 10 times more reactive. It, it's, it's violently effective of the spleen and the liver, both of whom can hold hemosiderin, but no one ever measures it because they were never taught to measure that. So the, the thing is that the, uh, the iron can get dysregulated. It doesn't get recycled properly. It's not, being, it's not able to release its stores. The ferritin is rising because it's being released because the, pro the, the recycling process is breaking down. Why? Because the energetics and the enzyme activity doesn't support it. And so the rising ferritin is a sign of liver uh, metabolic dysfunction. And no one, you, you, you knew that hypoferritinemia, the, the cytokine storm that you were treating in the in the wards and in the in the uh, hospital could have been interpreted as classic raging copper deficiency, but you never had that training. And there's a wonderful article that that I can send you by world renowned MD PhD Leslie Clave, where he's talking about chronic copper deficiency being at the core of everyone's problem. And it was just published um, October of last year, and I believe Dr. Clave will be 90 next year. So he's a, he's a very active uh, researcher. He's written hundreds and hundreds of articles. But again, the, the copper side of the story is not known to, to the public. It's not known to the public's practitioners. And it's really, again, hiding behind that curtain. And so if you don't know about the curtain, if you don't know about the copper dynamics, you can't understand the iron dysregulation. And so what happens, Max, is that far too many practitioners confuse low iron in the blood, in the blood work, 
and don't think about that what that really is signaling is high iron in the tissue. And the reason why it's high in the tissue is it can't be released to get back into the recycling system. And so there is no blood test that measures iron in the tissue. Everything's in the blood. The only time you can get to the tissue level is to do either a, a Tesla II MRI, which is very expensive, or you can do a needle biopsy of the liver, which is very painful in both situations. You first, you know, I, I, I would love to know how much iron I have in my liver, but I'm not afraid to, to spend the money or, or go through the pain. But the point is, no one knows about that copper iron dynamic from the 20s. No one knows that this liver is, it was never designed to store iron. It's designed to store copper and retinol. And, and what are we taught now? Oh, be careful of, of copper and retinol. You can become toxic from them. Which is like, no, that's that's exact opposite of the truth. And so then the liver has become an iron storage depot, which was never designed by Mother Nature to do that. I mean, it, it has the capacity. The hepatocytes have that natural ability to store iron, but it was never supposed to be dominant function. It was supposed to be storing copper and retinol to support the metabolism of the mitochondria throughout the body. And the part that a lot of people don't know about uh, is the work of uh, Dr. Hammerling in 2016. He'd be a great scientist for you to, to chat with because his area of expertise is retinol and how important retinol is to mitochondrial function. And there's, there's something, there's a complex between, or there's a, a component, we'll call it. It's a um, structure between complex three and complex four. And the electrons, turns out the electrons ride the tail of the retinol to get from three to four. And what Dr. Hamelin has been able to prove is that it's a lack of retinol that causes the Warburg effect. And it's like, wow, that's fascinating. And, and it's interesting, Dr. Warburg never coined that phrase. That was actually, I think it was coined in the 80s. But, but the point is, when did they first know that lack of retinol caused cancer? 1925. Montrose T. Burroughs, working at the Rockefeller Institute, he gets his MD degree at Hopkins in 1909. 1925, <clears throat> he publishes an article and four articles in 1926 proving that retinol deficiency causes cancer. Well, what's, what is cancer? Well, it's a buildup of iron and the lack of retinol, the electrons can't flow. And you, you begin to, and, and the only way to explain the Warburg effect, so the body is designed to burn oxygen in the, in the presence of copper, and in the Warburg effect, what's happening? The cells are choosing to use fermentation to make energy, even though oxygen is present. Well, there's only one way to explain why they can't do, do the oxygen. There's no copper. There's no bioavailable copper. And the, the cancer cells are filling up with iron, which is taking, it's just, it's destroying the availability of copper in that situation. So it's just, a, it's a wholesale a uh, different way of thinking about what's happening inside the cells and inside the, uh, the mitochondria. But the iron dysregulation is tremendously significant, but people are confusing low iron in the blood work and not aware of the high iron in the tissue. And once you realize that iron can get stuck in the tissue, and, and famous scientists from all over the planet have studied it, it's it's in the literature. There's there's thousands of articles about it, but that wisdom doesn't make it into the classroom in doctor school. It's not it's not in the clinical cur clinical curriculum, and that's where I think the breakdown is in the understanding of the problem. Yeah, a, a couple of clinical cases to kind of analyze, given it with your frame of reference. So. Hereditary hemochromatosis is the most common um, acknowledged kind of clinical uh, uh, setting of iron overload, and that is mutations 
in in these uh, in certain genes that uh, basically yeah. people of Northern European descent, and the thought being that it, it evolved in situations of iron low iron in the environment, and and that these mutations help us, you know, hang, ha- help these people hang on to iron more efficiently. I, I have seen um, heterozygotes of uh, hemochromatosis, so people that carry one one mutated gene, and right. um, they have had ferritins of 500 600 um indicating some degree of iron overload and then when they go on a very low carbohydrate diet or eat, eat often a carnivore type diet so they're eating a heap of steak um paradoxically according to the mainstream and um, paradigm that 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 iron um overload disappears and the ferritin actually goes back under 300 maybe it goes to 200 so this is a a, a kind of a point that most other doctors and GPs kind of scratch their heads at because they think that if you're eating very heme, uh, hemoglobin, heme <laughs> iron rich sources of food, then that will contribute to iron overload. My, my interpretation of what was going on is that um, essentially we were fixing a degree of, of metabolic dysfunction that was dysregulating iron, um, but iron homeostasis. But by what you're saying, it sounds like we probably repleted copper and um, in in that nutrient dense animal food diet, and and that kind of fixed uh, the, the, this this ferritin um, number. So so and obviously the patients lost a heap of weight and they're feeling great. So what's your interpretation of that um, an, uh, observation? Yeah, the the, the, um, the hemochromatosis is it's basically a, a condition of copper deficiency. And uh, when we were talking about the the, the PAM enzyme earlier. Some very important research that I'm going to come back to hemochromatosis in just a second. But um, there was a husband and wife team, Betty Iper and Richard Maines, that studied this enzyme for 45 years, 20 years at Hopkins and 25 years at University of Connecticut Medical Center. They had funding for 45 years to study this one enzyme. That, that's, a, that's a head scratcher right there. But in um, 2008 to 2012, uh, they were engaged in um, doctoral research with, with um, two of their students. And they did a series of experiments with mice. And they manipulated the PAM gene. So it lowered its ability to express the PAM enzyme. And in another group of, of mice, they withheld copper and got the same level of low PAM expression. So they manipulated the gene, they withheld copper, and then in two separate experiments, uh, four years apart, they fed copper to both sets of mice. And in both experiments, PAM expression turned back on, both with the defective genes and with the copper withheld animals. And the... uh, student in the second series of experiments. His name is Eric Geyer. He's an MD, PhD at Harvard. He's an ophthalmologist. And uh, in his doctoral dissertation, yeah, I I take the time to read those things. (laughs) It's It's amazing information in there, Max. But he made the comment that heterozygous um, defects are a sign of copper deficiency. Put it in black and white. And so I think what we, to come back to your hemochromatosis topic, is hemochromatosis a quote gene defect or is it a mineral deficiency? And and to your point, people change their diet. They probably would have responded better to organ meats than to muscle meats because there'd be even more copper there. Uh, they might need copper supplementation beyond that. But the, But the point is, the body's not stupid. The body, think about the wisdom of the body. If, if, if we can buy the fact that, that copper is playing a central role in managing light, managing energy, you know, managing the handoffs and just many, many different things. If it starts to sense that it uh, doesn't have enough copper, it's going to start to change the expression of different genes. And especially those that are handling iron, and so, again, one way to interpret hemochromatosis is, well, there's no source of copper. We're going to take this organism offline because we know that if we start to build up the iron, 
it's eventually going to kill the animal. And that's a rather dark way of thinking about it. But again, I think the body does have this innate wisdom. It says, we don't have the, the requisite substrates to keep energy production. So we're just going to start to, to change the, the dynamics. And so hemochromatosis will respond to phlebotomy. Very important to get, get the iron out, get the ferritin out of the system. Um, when I really began to become more sensitive to this whole issue, uh, it, was, it was December of, of 2015. And Dr. Liz said, you know, you've been talking to a lot of people about iron. He says, have you studied yours yet? I went, uh, no, don't. So I did a, did a blood test and found out that my hemoglobin was 18.3 and my ferritin was 237. Well, it's a good thing I was wearing brown pants when I got the results back because that <laughs> freaked me out. And so that's what I really started to take a deeper dive into understanding this copper iron dynamic and who's, who's on first and what's on second. And the people who understand this the best are the Italian researchers, the Indian researchers, the Icelandic researchers. What do they all have in common? Their countries begin with the letter I. I don't know why, but they, they just have this awareness about iron metabolism that most don't. But the thing is, um, it was the copper that was missing in my body that was, a, that was not allowing the regulation of the iron. You know, do, do I have uh, heterozygous genes for this? I don't know. I've, I don't have the courage to do the, the gene test to find out. I just know I feel pretty darn good with my diet and with the protocol and with the, the supplementation that I do. Uh, I guess if I was a real true scientist, I would subject myself to the gene research to find out. But I take uh, comfort in that if the body is properly nourished, the body will express genes properly. Because I think that you have genetics, epigenetics, because the epigenetics are, are the environment that are influencing the gene function. But what's above epigenetics? Energetics. And when the energy is being produced right, it's going to influence epigenetics, which is then going to influence the genes. And I think we've become too gene-centric. We need to go back to energy to drive the, the environment to get the genes to express. And so uh, hemochromatosis is an enigma in that... that um, Heme diet will correct it, but I think you, you nailed it. You're getting other nutrients in that process. You might also be getting uh, more fat, more animal-based fat. And the part that people need to understand is that there are two critical pumps that run the copper enzymes. One, one pump called ATP7B makes ceruloplasmin. The other pump is called ATP7A. It makes all the other copper enzymes. It's amazing what it does. But both of those pumps are activated by retinol. It's actually retinoic acid. It's a, it's a, a hormonal form of, of retinol. And that's buried in the research. Cars, Cousins and Barber, 1987. You know, one little sentence says it all. And so that is the cornerstone of truth that's not taught in doctor school is that these pumps need retinol in order to load the key enzymes to regulate the iron to allow for proper regulation of the, of the system. And we live in a, a fat-free diet now. Most people are afraid of fat, right? And that, that all started in 1955 when Eisenhower had his first heart attack. Ansel Keys flexed his muscles and said, we've got to get cholesterol out of the diet, right? And we can go into the, all the controversy of that. But what they were really doing was eliminating retinol. And they knew back, they knew back in the 20s how important retinol was. And so it took a generation for it to be eliminated from our diet. And so there's just been this gradual erosion of the nutrient density of our food, which I think you understand and you advocate people going back to a more ancestral diet to get the nutrients that our body is designed to run on. That, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, and when, I hear, when I'm hearing copper requires retinol to function, uh, I immediately think of the foods that 
a co co will have rich source of both copper and retinol, and that's that's liver. Um, that's yeah. that that's a ruminant liver. The other enzyme that my listeners will know has a key uh, link to retinol is and and well, vitamin A is the photoreceptor system, and all your photoreceptors yeah. are are bound covalently to to retinol. And when we're exposed to a whole bunch of of artificial blue light. It uh, basically destroys that mm-hmm. linkage, and and causes all kinds of of havoc inside the cell. So, and there, I'll make a couple points about the the hemochromatosis. It sounds that, um, or maybe I'll ask you, what, what, how can we identify copper deficiency, and 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 how can we best replete copper given what you've said? Right. And just to reinforce what you just said about the retinol, the retinol being stored in the liver supports the retina of the eye. When did they first know about that? In the early 1920s. But um, the, the, the key is, under, and I'm, I'm just having a senior moment, Max. I'm sorry. I got I wanted to make that point, and I can't remember what question you were asking me. That, that's okay, it. and and no, I'll, I'll I'll also make the point that isotretinoin is a retinoid. It's a synthetic retinol, and right. there's evidence that it can interfere with vision in certain patients who take this medication that's for exactly acne. Right. So, um, and yeah. there's a finely tuned system here with with regard to the body's handling of of these these enzymes and these cofactors, and it's not surprising to me that people could become copper deficient if they're not including nutrient dense sources of food. Um, They're not including liver. They're not including um, grass fed butter. They're not including deep sea fish. Um, All all these important sources of vitamin A. And I'm I'm talking about preformed retinol. I'm talking about beta carotene or this idea that we can, you know, um, get, get our vitamin A needs met through plants. It's just not true. So maybe, yeah, riff on that for a bit more, if you could. Sure. So in order to restore copper, it's, it's really, really important. And uh, I came across some research uh, just a few weeks ago, which was fascinating. Um, I grew up in Baltimore, and my nickname is Baltimorely. And we bought our dairy from a company called Cloverland Dairy. Now, bear with me, Max. I'm not a singer, but, but I want to share this jingle with your, with your listeners. Milk and butter and eggs and cheese, fresh from the farm to you. If you don't own a cow, call Cloverland now, Northfield 92222. Now, I first heard that, or I first remember hearing that when I was four years old. That was 67 years ago. And that jingle, for some reason, just got stored. And it's critically important with the article I just found a couple weeks ago. Back to James McCarg, 1925. University of Kentucky, and he's identifying the foods that have copper, but they also are rich in retinol. Whole milk, butter, eggs, and the cheese that they're talking about is curd, cottage cheese made from curd. How do you spell curd? C-U hyphen R-D. Right, got to got to spell it right, and so our ancestors depended upon that basic diet daily. They were getting exposure to whole milk, butter, eggs, and cheese, and then once a week they were eating liver, and they were fine. Back back in the thirties, back in the thirties, the average intake of copper was four to six milligrams of copper a day. By the sixties, it had dropped to two to five. And now we're supposed to believe that we can get by on nine tenths of one milligram of copper a day. That's a complete violation of the design of our body and the design of our metabolism. So what we're bumping up against, unfortunately, is, you know, we we buy uh, unprocessed dairy from a farmer about 15 miles from where we live. It's absolutely milk is not supposed to be white. It's supposed to be yellow. And it's this this beautiful yellow uh, milk, and the butter is very very rich. With obviously, it's got um, a lot of beta carotene. Why is the cow important? Because it turns beta carotene into retinol, 
Thank you, Cal, for that. Eggs do the, or chickens do the exact same thing, eating bugs and grass. Turn that beta carotene into retinol. Thank you, little chickens. And people don't know that that chemistry is taking place inside these animals' body. But I think the challenge we've got now, Max, is the, to, to your earlier points about glyphosate. I'm really freaking out about glyphosate, even within the regenerative farming movement. And I have, I have tremendous respect for, for the farmers who are trying to bring us back to, to what our ancestors took for granted. But the thing is, it's in the air. It's everywhere. It's, it's so pervasive in the soil. And it's like, there's a wow factor to it and there are ways to correct it. But how many farmers are taking the time and the discipline to make that happen. So I think the traditional sources of copper, uh, you have to be careful. A lot of people rely on nutrient tables that they go to online. Do you know when those nutrient tables were last updated? It was in the 1950s. They have all sorts of eye candy now. They look really cool online, but the raw data hasn't been changed since the 50s. And so these, these historical sources, nuts, seeds, organ meats, uh, shellfish. These were all very rich sources of copper. Do they still exist today? Not in the same way that they did 50 to 100 years ago. And so within the RCP, we're very focused on an ancestral diet. We're very focused on getting the right nutrients. But what we're also realizing when we first started it, we relied on uh, organ meats as a source of copper. What one of my students did, very, very enterprising individual, she took the leading brand of desiccated liver and she sent it to a lab to see what the, the mineral composition was. And according to the nutrient table, there should be nine milligrams of copper and three milligrams of iron. She got the results back from the analysis. It was reversed. There was more iron than copper. And that was sort of a, a shock to the to the reality of, of what we're up against. And so it was really, um, once I realized what 2020 was, it was an IQ test, as we talked about earlier. Um, the next year, I, I developed, a, um, in partnership with a, a nutrient company, uh, Formula IQ, I developed a, a supplement called Recuperate. And I think what people need to come to, to terms with is we do need to supplement copper in our diet beyond the foods. And and I forgive me if I sound like a supplement whore, I'm not. What I'm really focused on is people need to get this nutrient, this critical nutrient back into their metabolism. And we chose to do it in a food-based form. There's desiccated liver, there's spirulina, there's a pinch of, of turmeric, and there's copper, copper bisglycinate. And it's a very bioavailable form of, of copper. Um, I think people need to, to realize I've got, I've got diabetic clients, type 2 diabetic clients. And I'm sure you have clients who, who are struggling with their blood sugar. Did you know that blood sugar is a, is a copper issue? That it's when it's rising, there's a lack of copper in the body? You've been trained that it's an insulin issue, right? It's actually a copper issue. And goes, that research goes back into the 30s and 40s and 50s. But, but the thing is, it, it turns out that, that um, children, Menke's children, Menke's disease are very copper deficient. They're the most glucose intolerant people on the planet. They have no copper. And so the, the copper issue is really central to this, the blood sugar dynamic. And so, um, People, I've got clients who type 2 diabetics taking five and six of my supplements, which have two milligrams of copper in them, and they have control over their blood sugar for the first time in their adult life. And it's like, I didn't tell them to do that. I, t I say, take one, maybe two. But, but many of my clients are now realizing on their own, it's kind of like this um, 100th monkey syndrome. They're beginning to, there's this vibe out there that we need more copper. And they are beginning to get control of their blood sugar, which is then allowing them to 
wean off of the symptoms of metabolic syndrome. So it's, uh, a, imagine, it's a very, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I would just imagine they're not eating a standard American diet with the, that, that copper supplementation. I'm guessing they're eating also an, a Absolutely. pretty ancestral type diet at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely important component. Yeah. You're absolutely the, the, right. The, the point I want to make is that the, I, I think glyphosate is, and, and the wider use of industrial herbicides is this probably right. one of the biggest impacts on both health and human health and environmental health that no one's talking about. And, you know, w w the, the, I think the narrative around environmentalism is kind of has been hijacked to myopically focus on um, one product, which happens to be uh, a waste product of, of human uh, uh, re respiration, where we're turning a blind eye to the destruction of, uh, of soil microbes, the, the chelation and, and, and de deprivation of, of these trace minerals from, from soil and the consequent effects on the food nutrient density. So, um, that that's a massive topic and i think part of the job of my or one of my hopes with this podcast is to educate farmers and to get them thinking about the consequences of participating in an industrial food system right. that is contributing to the poisoning of the commons that is contributing to the commoditization of of the food supply and the subsequent um you know metabolic and nutritional micronutritional bankruptcy of of populations i i i I think that people can still make the right choice in terms of sourcing from local farmers. And I think um, that is still going to be the best bet. And I would encourage people to um, maybe do some testing. And I think the more access we could have to nutrient testing uh, the, and things like deuterium, things like iron, things like um, uh, fatty acid profiles, glyphosate, the, the better we could, right. we could make informed choices. And, and we could even probably guide the, uh, ag ag agronomist use of trace minerals in the land to therefore increase the the, the nutrient density of of the food. If we can identify a soil deficiency, then we can then make steps to to improve that. My only hesitation with supplementing copper um, in a supplement form is um, again, mm -hmm. what is is it in context of those cofactors? And two, does it contain deuterium? Have we deuterium depleted that? Um, that, that supplement because I wouldn't want to kind of be giving people copper which they might need but also be giving them a you know extra hit of deuterium that they they didn't need yeah no I think that's that's a fair comment and I can't speak to the the deuterium side I take a slightly different I think you alluded to uh, your conversations with Stephanie Seneff and one of the most riveting conversations I had with her was April of 2018 we were at a breakfast uh, table together. And she leaned forward and she said, Morley, would you like to know why glyphosate is so hard on copper metabolism? <laughs> I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> but but you, made, you made the point that there's a relationship between the clearance of deuterium and copper deficiency. And I think it's important for people to know that these, these dysfunctional metabolites may just be an expression of a lack of this critical uh, metal inside our body. And so um, I can't speak to what the deuterium status is of that of that supplement. And that's not the only one. There's copper creams out there that people can use. Uh, I think it's important for people to stretch their understanding of how important this mineral is. And there's been a century-long campaign to lower its presence on the planet. It goes back to the First World War. Uh, they had a lot of armaments they had to get rid of after the First World War. What did the armaments have? NPK. Oh, well, let's turn that into a fertilizer for the, for the farmers, not knowing that that NPK was blocking copper uptake in the root system. That's important to know. That, and that's you know, the, the, the genius of uh, soil, grass, cancer. Andre Fossin, that, that book was amazing to read. Again, biochemist who was a dairy farmer as a hobby, and he was the one who figured out, oh, well, the soil soil doesn't have the copper. It's not getting into the milk. It's not getting into my customers. And they're getting cancer. That's a really riveting series of connections for people to make that they may not have known otherwise. But he figured that out in the 1950s. And so the thing is, that was all pre-pesticides um, that we're talking about. And what I, one of my colleagues told me that glyphosate is actually the ninth most toxic 
chemical that's used in farming. I'm like, what? I can't imagine what the other eight are. And so it's just, again, we've got to put it into the context is how is that affecting the microzymal balance, the, the yeast and the bacteria that are supposed to be communicating with each other, getting the, the nutrients into the soil, into the root system, excuse me. And and you're right, you're absolutely right. We should be doing more testing, both of the soil and the food and the human eating the food. And the, the testing for copper and iron is at a very rudimentary stage. Max, there are eight um, tests that you can do to measure the bioavailability of copper. How many of them are barred by the Food and Drug Administration here in the States? All eight. And so we're not supposed to know the bioavailability of our copper. We're just supposed to know that we need more iron, which is that is so pedestrian and ill-informed that people have got to get off this iron bandwagon. I think you you know that, but they need they need to start to recognize the critical biochemical physiological role that goes back to the beginning of time for being able to harness iron and oxygen at the same time. Iron, master prooxidant on the planet, oxygen, second most reactive element. And what do they like to do? They like to play together. And what do they create? Rust. And so p- people need to realize that, that the plaque and all the dysfunction inside their body is an expression of rust that we recognize outside the body. It's just we've never been told that that rusting process was happening inside our our blood vessels and our nerves and our our tissue. And so I think people need to uh, the, the tests that we do within the the RCP community. It's called the Full Monty Iron Panel, and there's panels available in Australia and in Europe and here in the states. And people, there are about 13 different um, components to that test. And we're looking at different measures of iron. We're looking at copper. We're looking at ceruloplasma. We're looking at uric acid. Uric acid building in a body is a cl- clinical sign of copper deficiency. Uh, we're looking at, at vitamin A and vitamin D and the relationship between the two and a, a variety of other factors. And people can begin to take, get a deeper understanding of their basic um, mechanics, mineral mechanics, from that blood test. And it's, it's a very easy test to do. And it's just, it, it gives the practitioner and the patient tremendous insight about the ease and efficiency of their energy producing ability inside their body. Yeah, fa- f- fascinating. And we'll include that information for people who are interested in diving down. One last question for you, Molly. Do you ever do, or have you ever looked into a peripheral blood smear? Because, um, you know, Dr. Cruz said once that um, the th- kind of thing he's interested in is looking at the, the oxidation state of iron, like that in terms of uh, examining a, a blood smear. Do you, have you ever done that? And have you ever gleaned any kind of useful information about copper or iron status from that test? No, I've never, I've never done the peripheral blood smear. I would love to, love to uh, delve into that. Um, but what I do know is that um, a lot of people suffer from neuropathy in their peripheral tissue. And um, I first connected with Dr. Clavey, who I alluded to earlier. Um, it was probably 10 years ago. And uh, he was very gracious to take my call. And we've, we've talked many times since then. But he, he said, Morley, if any of your clients ever present with any form of neuropathy, he said it's a clinical sign of copper deficiency. And when when someone of that stature makes a statement like that, I, I take note and, and I've all helped a lot of people realize that, that that nerve sensation that they were having is really just a dysfunction and a deficiency of, of mental, mineral. And so I don't know the components of a peripheral blood smear, but I'll look into it and see what, what I can glean from that. But I'm pretty confident that iron is not being regulated properly in that blood smear. The oxidation state is probably not being regulated properly in that blood smear. And it, it's going to go back to a series of copper enzymes uh, and their dysfunction because they're not adequately um, 
energized. Would yeah, be, would be my kind of my my initial uh, comment. Yeah, and and I would add in B twelve repletion in there. If someone presents to me with with uh, peripheral neuropathy, I'd definitely be checking their their, their serum B twelve too, which is uh, definitely a possible cause additionally of uh, peripheral neuropathy. The um, I think this has been a very you, very. You know, Go on. Do you, do you know the Do you know the uh, You've heard of the intrinsic factor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what, the, what is the intrinsic factor called? It's it, a protein. It's a transport protein called cubulin. Ah, uh, it's C-U. copper dependent. It's copper dependent. There you go. <laughs> there, there you go. No, it's a, it's a, the, the symptoms of B twelve deficiency and copper deficiency are almost identical, Max. Mm-hmm. And so that's important for people to realize the 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 vitamin B nine folate. One one of my conversations with Dr. Clouvet years ago, I said I have this theory that all the B vitamins require copper and they regulate iron. He said, "Well, Morley, that's a that's a very provocative theory." So I can't I can't refute it or or defend it. He said, "But what I can tell you for a fact is that B nine is copper dependent." Well, when you think about what B9 does in the uh, production of vitamin D, in the breakdown of vitamin A, your whole understanding of the mechanics of the of those fat soluble vitamins changes in a flash, because you realize, oh, B9, it's reacting to the sunlight. Oh, it must be the copper inside the B9 that is attracting the sunlight. It completely changes your understanding of the dynamics of the chemistry. Yeah, and and that is another thing that Cruz just talked about is the non-visual photoreceptor function of of vitamin B twelve, and yeah, at at the core of of uh, a lot of these um, visual properties is these these ion, these uh, minerals. So yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating um, conversation that we've had, Molly. Thank you very much, and I'll include mm-hmm. those if you can send me those those that information. I'll include that in the in the show notes and. Um, we sure. there's a lot we haven't even talked about. We haven't talked about um, uh, iron dysregulation as it relates to cardiovascular disease, and perhaps we could talk a bit more about metabolic syndrome in another time, and and, and obviously magnesium too. So um, lots for for people to think about, and uh, yeah. So thank you very much for your time, and um, I guess yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to talk again. I look forward to it. I really appreciate the time and the and the exchange. It's been fascinating. Mm-hmm.